With part two of our lecture, we pick up with an event that would devastate not just Europe, or at least much of Europe, particularly the eastern part, but also a good part of Asia from China throughout the Middle East, and that would be the Mongol invasion. So during the mid-12th century, the Mongol tribes will unite under uh, their leader, Genghis Khan, very famously. I'm sure most of you have heard of Genghis Khan. And under him and his successors, the Mongols would conquer a good part of the known world, uh, inclusive of, of much of East Europe and Russia, which is where our focus is. But uh, for instance, in my world history uh, course, we would talk a great deal about their impact on China, where they would establish a new dynasty. Uh, and in my Middle East courses, uh, probably the Middle East would take a bigger hit than any other part of the world, uh, where we would see an end to the caliphate, the complete destruction of Baghdad, uh, and most of the Middle East being overrun. Uh, by the Mongols. And I think this map gives you a pretty good idea of how extensive their conquests are going to be. Now we should note it's going to happen within a very short, relatively speaking, short space of time. When we consider the size of the, uh, of the territory that they uh, bring under their rule, uh, starting with Genghis Khan, pretty much running its course uh, up through his grandsons. And the Mongols are not a huge population, so this means that they will become pretty uh, well dispersed uh, you know, across the territories that they conquer, and, and pretty much in every case eventually absorbing uh, or being absorbed into whatever the local or already existing civilization was, right? So in the case of China, they, they will eventually adopt uh, Chinese forms of government, adopting Confucianism as a basis of that. Uh, the, the dynasty they established would take a Chinese name and so forth. In the case of the Middle East, uh, pretty much adopting Islam. Probably in Europe, the only, the only part of Europe where they're really going to have uh, any staying power, where they do have some impact on the already existing, kind of emerging, still, still developing civilization, will be in the case of Russia. The Russian state that will be most impacted is the Kievan Rus state, which we already encountered, centered around the uh, present-day city of Kiev, which you might re recall had become Christian in 987. That, in fact, had been the basis for its unity. And by the time of the Mongol invasion, it was a society dominated by a noble class of landowners known as boyars. Uh, they're going to take a big hit, and uh, effectively the Principality of Kiev will begin to fall apart uh, in large measure because of the Mongol invasion, which proves to be very disruptive, and that will create an opening for a new uh, Russian center to emerge as the dominant one, Kiev eventually being sacked by North Russian princes in 1169. And we should note that during this period, you know, coming up to the Mongol invasion, but then carrying on uh, even after it happens, the, the land-owning elite, who we refer to in the case of Russia as boyars, will maintain a dominant political position. Not entirely different from what we've seen in Western Europe, in effect, the noble class, if you will. Uh, but we, we might also note that they will actually maintain their political dominance for a much longer period of time, right up until the 19th century. Uh, in the case of Russia. And from a pretty early point, they're going to become very cooperative with the Mongols. So for some period, the Mongols will have a kind of overlordship, uh, establishing a number of principalities known as Khanates, the most important of which will be Kipchak, and the boyars to some extent playing the role of tributaries, acknowledging their overlordship uh, and providing revenue for them, uh, but able to, to some degree, maintain a degree of autonomy uh, within this broader framework. And one of them will eventually emerge as the dominant state and eventually pushing back on Mongol overlordship. So in a very real sense, that will mark the beginning of the emergence of Russia. And so you could say the Mongols played a very important role in this regard in, uh, in the sense that they kind of knocked Kiev out of the way, creating a vacuum that somebody else is able to fill. Uh, and again, the Mongols will rule very indirectly pretty much allowing the boyars to manage their own affairs. Eventually, you will have princes who are the dominant political figure in a number of different Russian states. They do provide tribute to the Mongols, but for the most part, 
uh, pretty autonomous. One of them, Alexander Nevsky, the prince of Novgorod, a city, is going to prove particularly cooperative and eventually the Mongols will grant him the title of Grand Prince, in a sense elevating him so that he has a certain measure of authority with regard to other Russian princes. And it is he and his de uh, descendants who will lay the foundation for what will become the Russian state and eventually the Russian Empire, becoming the princes of Moscow and eventually the leaders of Russia. And the Russian Empire, of course, will be quite extensive, much larger, by the way, than the present day state of Russia, in some ways territorially corresponding more to what during the 20th century constituted the Soviet Union. So we're going to stop there as far as developments in Eastern Europe, returning to Western Europe, where there is during this period a growing dissatisfaction with the church, the Catholic Church, uh, largely as a consequence of what is perceived as a growing problem of corruption. Now, some of this reflects that at a kind of a more local level, uh, churches are becoming uh, more dependent on uh, local lords or nobles, right? So very often high officials in the church ga are gaining their offices as fiefs from nobles, uh, which, you know, their, pri their primary motive for uh, becoming a part of the clergy in this case, in order to elevate their own political status or that of their family or for financial gain, right? Using these fiefs as a, uh, as a kind of resource. Uh, and corresponding to that, many of them caring very little for their spiritual responsibilities, right? So it's kind of a, a very bad combination of two things, that they're more in it for the money or power, uh, and at the same time, uh, not are pretty indifferent to their obligations as members of the clergy, uh, in some cases even incompetent. This is actually becoming a problem with the monasteries as well, which are also coming under the control of local lords and increasingly not living up to their reputations for learning and holiness. So, you know, by this point in time, there is a growing feeling of a need for reform. And a part of that reflecting the idea that the church, uh, the pope, if you will, or the center of the church needs to reassert its authority uh, over the uh, various uh, positions of archbishops and bishops and so forth, as well as the monasteries, right? They need to be brought back under the control of the church so one response to this is going to be the Cluniac Reform Movement, which begins in eastern France around the Abbey of Cluny, a monastery, uh, whence the name comes. And, you know, again, part of the problem as is perceived in the church is that at the local level, they've come under the control of local lords and nobles too much. So part of the problem or part of the solution as they see it is to become more independent in that regard. Uh, but they also realize that they have to uh, eliminate certain practices and abuses that had crept into the religious communities. And so kind of getting back to core values, stressing work and demanding more community worship, you know, kind of remembering why you got into the whole monastery business uh, to begin with. But again, from the point of view of the church, the real problem is about bringing the church, uh, bringing the local churches, the monasteries and so forth back under the control institutionally of the Catholic Church, in particular under the authority of the Pope. Uh, and so, you know, we might ask the question, well, you know, in what way are lords, nobles interfering with the church at the local level? And it really comes down to who decides who is appointed to various positions within the church, you know, starting at the top with archbishop, bishops, and so forth, but then coming down the line. Of course, at the highest level, uh, you know, as far as which noble is interfering, it would probably be the king. You know, further down the line, it might be a, a noble of lesser rank. Uh, so in order to understand uh, how this became a problem, you need to understand what lay investiture is, right? So over the, the course of the Middle Ages, a practice had developed whereby the church would make the initial selection as far as an appointment, but then it would have to meet with the approval of, you know, whichever lord uh, could be a king. Again, a king at the higher level uh, or a noble of lesser rank uh, further down the line. Uh, would have to approve of that selection with regard to any church or monastery uh, within his territory, within his fief or kingdom and so forth. And that would happen through a ritual known as lay investiture. Uh, lay referring to this kind of secular aspect uh, of the process of appointing an individual to a position in the church. Uh, and so the problem had become that even though the church would make the initial selection, increasingly it was the case that uh, they would have to select somebody who would be approved by the local lord, 
you know, be it the king or again, you know, a noble of lesser rank. Otherwise, uh, that individual would never be able to, to hold that position. And so, uh, particularly from the perspective of Pope Gregory VII, and, and this is going to be the first attempt at, at seriously reforming this process, uh, he, he's thinking the best solution is to eliminate lay investiture completely, that the, uh, the nobles, the lords, the, or be it the king or someone of lesser rank, should not have a role in making appointments to the church. That should be solely the decision of the church. And so he's going to try and eliminate lay investiture. So you kind of end up here with a, a situation pitting popes against secular authority, in particular kings, right? So from the point of view of the king, uh, and this is going to really become a major issue with respect to the Holy Roman Empire, where you know Holy Roman emperors are still hoping to assert some kind of genuine authority. Uh, you know who gets to make appointments related to the church within the kingdom or within the empire. Right. So, you know, from the point of view of a king, you want to have somebody. The church is a very important institution, has tremendous influence. You want to make sure that the members of the clergy within your kingdom are in some ways acting on your behalf. Right. That they're looking out for your interests. From the point of view of the pope, uh, he wants to see people in there who are, you know, primarily loyal to him. Uh, but I think it's not too hard to understand why the king might have an issue with this. And so this is really going to come to a head. Uh, between Gregory the Seventh, who's really promoting this idea of eliminating lay investiture, and the Holy Roman Emperor of Germany, King Henry the Fourth, uh, you know, in terms of who gets to make appointments, particularly at the highest level of the clergy, if you're talking about archbishops and bishops. And so at some point, Gregory the Seventh is going to issue a decree forbidding clerics from receiving investiture from lay leaders. And Henry IV is going to take grave issue with that. And that is going to lead to what is known as the investiture controversy. Now, the immediate cause is going to be regarding a specific appointment, but it's really a litmus test for who gets to make those appointments in general. Uh, so there is a vacancy at the Bishopric of Milan. Milan, a city uh, presently in northern Italy, uh, part of the Holy Roman Empire at that time. And so Henry IV and Gregory VII are going to end up backing different candidates. But again, this is really about who gets to make the appointment, right? For Gregory VII, this is really about establishing a principle. And so at some point, the Pope threatens uh, King Henry IV with excommunication. So in, in the Catholic Church, excommunication basically means that you would no longer be able to receive the sacraments uh, from any priest. Uh, which, in effect, is a one-way ticket to hell, right? I mean, the, kind of within the Catholic faith, if you're not able to receive the sacraments, uh, you're basically never going to make it to heaven. And back in those days, that would have been a very serious threat. Though I should note, that kind of thing still happens today. You know, every now and then, if a political figure who happens to be Catholic is promoting a policy that the Catholic Church views disfavorably, uh, you hear rumblings about the possibility of excommunication. Generally never happens, uh, but you know, it could be an issue related to contraception or abortion or something of that nature. Uh, where, you know, you'll hear a bishop or an archbishop say, well, you know, if you do that, there is this possibility of excommunication. Uh, but, you know, back in the day, you know, we're talking about the high Middle Ages, this would have been a much more serious issue. Well, the emperor responds, King Henry IV responds by basically calling upon all the bishops within his empire, uh, the German bishops, to uh, reject the authority of the pope, to depose him, at which point the pope excommunicates the king, which, by the way, also means in theory he has no authority over his subjects. They are now freed from any kind of allegiance to him. And for many of his subjects, this would have been uh, this would have been a really difficult choice, right? In terms of you know whether to respect his authority or to, uh, in some sense, actively go against the church. And you know, back in those days, your primary concern was about what was going to happen to your soul after you died. Uh, from, from the point of view of many of the German nobles, right, the various princes who, in theory, we talked about how the Holy Roman Emperor has, in some ways, very limited real authority. They're going to see this as an opportunity to rebel against the king, basically to reject his authority outright. And eventually, Henry IV is going to cave. 
realizing that this has become a genuine threat to his power, he is going to travel humbly to northern Italy where he meets the Pope at Canossa and basically gets on his knees and begs for forgiveness and absolution, uh, which, by the way, uh, the Pope, uh, based on the tenets of the Catholic faith, is obligated to give. Uh, you know, so it kind of depends how you look at it. On the face of it, it would seem that the Pope won. Uh, you know, some historians have seen this as kind of a very uh, savvy, strategic move on the part of Henry IV, that he kind of recognized that the Pope would have to forgive him. Uh, and arguably, the Pope might have hoped that this would play out further, right, to kind of resolve uh, this question of who gets to make appointments and what, what should be, uh, if any, the role uh, of secular authority. Uh, in, in fact, the practice of investiture will continue, and in a sense, this struggle between the church and secular authority represented by kings will carry on. Uh, if we were meeting in person, I might ask at this point, who do you think is eventually going to win? Uh, you know, very often people are like, oh, well, you know, we just kind of heard about this uh, episode where it seems that the church came out on top. Uh, you know, the church is going to win. Well, uh, you know, before you, you come to that kind of conclusion, you might consider the current state of affairs. I mean, how much political authority, how much political leverage does the Catholic Church have today uh, uh, in, in Europe? You know, never mind, like, you know, uh, Catholic countries across the world. And, you know, it's very limited. It has very little. It might have some kind of moral influence. But, you know, in actual fact, the Catholic Church does not have really any power at all when it comes to uh, political leadership in different states. So eventually secular authority will win out, uh, but it's not going to happen uh, in the immediate future. So the investiture controversy will kind of carry on. Uh, a compromise is arrived at in 1122 with the Concordat of Worms. Uh, Worms is uh, the name of a city uh, in what today is Germany. It has nothing to do with little squiggly creatures in the soil. Uh, and so this kind of rep represents a, a, a compromise, but one that in a sense kind of maintains the, the role of the king uh, and of secular authority in general uh, with respect to appointments, right? So church officials would elect bishops, but still they're going to be invested by the secular lord. Uh, they do try to diminish the ability of the secular lord. You know, again, it could be the king, somebody of a lesser rank. Uh, try to, you know, limit his ability to challenge whoever has been appointed by the church. Uh, but in effect, not that much is going to change. Uh, you know, so this is, you know, at the end of the day, this isn't even just about church appointments, right? And this is even more than just about the church wanting to manage its own affairs. The church is effectively, uh, with, you know, this whole controversy, claiming authority over secular rulers, right? I mean, remember that at some point, Gregory VII actually, uh, through excommunication, basically sought to depose Henry IV, right? That they have the right to depose kings that are not abiding by the directives of the church, uh, not least with respect to appointments. And then again, remembering how influential and how powerful during the 12th century the Catholic Church would have been in respective kingdoms. So again, eventually secular authority is going to win out, but that is really not going to become clear until many centuries down the road. And for the time being, the Catholic Church is starting to become much more active with respect to European affairs. Now, some of that reflects the growing authority of the Pope within the church structure, which by the 12th century uh, is very well defined. You have a very well defined hierarchical structure with the Pope and his papal curia, you know, kind of his uh, council of bishop advisors at the apex. Uh, we already saw how uh, Gregory VII was becoming much more active within the affairs of the Holy Roman Empire. By the pontificate of Innocent III, the Catholic Church is really promoting this idea that they should act as supreme judge of European affairs and really showing a willingness to use whatever tool they have in their kit in order to promote that end, right? Which is very much about politics. So we've already seen how excommunication might be used as a kind of leverage against a ruler. Uh, another uh, very powerful tool was what's known as an interdict, whereby uh, the Pope could basically forbid priests uh, if, within an entire region from dispensing the sacraments, right, for anyone. So imagine if you're the king and an interdict has been imposed upon your kingdom, whereby uh, none of your subjects are able to, uh, to receive the sacraments. And that would create a tremendous amount of anxiety 
uh, and discontent uh, and would certainly be a threat to your authority. Now, coming back to the issue of reform, uh, you know, a lot of this is happening at a, a much more grassroots level in connection with the monastic movement, right? In fact, we're seeing the founding of new monastic orders. Uh, you know, the, again, the basic idea is that a lot of the uh, monastic orders that had been around for a while had become quite corrupt, had kind of lost sight of what the whole point was. So one way of dealing with that would just simply be start anew. And a really good example of that would be the Cistercians order, uh, founded in 1098 by a group of monks who were just simply dissatisfied with the lack of strict discipline in the Benedictine monastery. And so, as you might imagine, the Cister uh, Cistercians are going to be very strict, you know, ma ma making sure they have a very simple diet. There's kind of a feeling that, you know, a bit of gluttony had actually kind of crept into the monasteries. You know, people were uh, having very sumptuous meals, drinking a lot of wine and so forth. That was considered inappropriate for, you know, if you're a monk, you should be living a life of austerity. Uh, that would also uh, correspond to your clothing, that you should only have one robe each. And then again, of course, emphasizing prayer and work. Uh, but, you know, kind of the, the idea that you should get into it spiritually, right? Not just going through the motions, but it's something that you should really be, uh, that you should really feel a kind of spiritual commitment to. We might consider at this point, uh, you know, what, what was it like to be a practicing Catholic for regular people, right, at this point? Uh, you know, the Catholic uh, faith had been developing for centuries. A lot of practices had been, uh, had kind of been absorbed into the Catholic Church. Uh, we talked a bit about how early on there was a willingness to incorporate pagan practices into the church, just kind of redefine them within a Christian framework. Uh, and so that is going to inform some aspects of popular religion. Uh, but again, by popular religion, what we mean is, you know, kind of how regular folk experience their religion. So, you know, of course, the sacraments are still at the heart of it. And that goes right back to the earliest days of the Christian faith. But a lot of other things have kind of accrued to the religion in the meantime. Uh, one really important aspect of Catholicism by this point is the worshiping of saints. Right? So it's kind of this idea that there are certain holy individuals that you might pray to uh, who then might intercede with God on your behalf. And this, in fact, becomes a much more common way of praying than to pray directly to God or even Jesus. Right. Uh, you know, now why this is the case. Uh, very often, these individuals have very well-defined personalities, very well-defined background stories, very relatable, right? Kind of, kind of the idea that you have different individuals who look out for the welfare of different groups, uh, what we often call patron saints. You know, it could be uh, the patron saint of a particular order of knights. It could be the patron saint of shoemakers. You know, so you know, it's kind of making your the the connection with the divine more personal. Uh, but later on, during the Protestant Reformation, uh, there are going to be some people who feel that this is not appropriate, that this is moving too far away from what the Christian faith was in its origin. Now, probably the most important saint uh, for many Catholics then, and arguably even now, would be the Virgin Mary. Uh, so again, the idea is that you're praying to the saint who will then kind of speak on your behalf, in this case, uh, if you're praying to the Virgin Mary, perhaps will act as a mediator with her son, Jesus. And to some degree also, this reflects the idea that, you know, in this case, as a woman, uh, as uh, somebody who, uh, you know, is very often presented as being very gentle, very uh, emp empathetic, you know, that she, that she will be more understanding, right? That she will represent you in the best possible way with Jesus. Uh, that Jesus, and, and certainly the Father, you know, God himself, uh, might be a bit harsh in his judgment, right? I mean, after all, uh, Jesus is supposed to judge all sinners in the end days. So, you know, it's like maybe it might be a good idea if you can get the Virgin Mary to speak on your behalf. Now, related to saint worship will also be the veneration of relics. Uh, relics are artifacts that are considered to have some kind of holy quality to them, usually the bones of saints uh, or objects immediately connected with them. Right, so the idea is that if you're praying uh, before a relic, uh, this will increase the efficacy of your prayer, right? That these relics have miraculous powers. Uh, you know, and by the way, a lot of these practices are still with us today, uh, even though, again, uh, during the Protestant Reformation, you know, as we get into the uh, late 15th, early 16th century, there's going to be 
uh, kind of a growing movement of opposition to these practices as straying too much from kind of foundational principles. Uh, but even, even today, you still have this idea. So for instance, uh, probably most important would be relics associated with Jesus. There are some churches, if you go to today, they will claim to have a piece of the true cross upon which Jesus was crucified. And kind of the idea, if you're praying before this cross, uh, you know, again, that it somehow increases the efficacy of your prayer than, say, if you were praying just in your bedroom. Uh, you know, other, most relics uh, are like bones of saints, right? So, and there are many churches today, uh, you know, in Europe, if you go there, uh, you can find out about the different relics they house, and there are, you know, many different traditions about the kind of miraculous powers that they have. Now, two really important practices that developed within the Catholic Church, and from the point of view of historians, were probably not there at the beginning. Uh, and they, uh, by the way, one of them is still definitely with us. Another one would actually be kind of discredited. Uh, so the one that's discredited is going to be indulgences. And you don't really hear about that too much anymore. Uh, purgatory, on the other hand, is still very much with us. So what is purgatory? If you're Catholic, you probably know what it is. Uh, the basic premise in the Christian faith is if you believe in Jesus, you're going to heaven. If you don't, you're going to hell. Uh, but that did create a bit of a dilemma for Catholics. How do you deal with someone who really misbehaved in their life, uh, but was a believer, right? I mean, so, you know, in theory, they should go to heaven, but there's kind of, you know, a bit, bit of discomfort with the idea that this guy who did, did a lot of really bad things and could, you know, be even like killing people and so forth, uh, by virtue of believing Jesus is, you know, all of this is going to be forgotten. So uh, in connection with this, they developed the idea of purgatory, a place of punishment in which if you're a believer, you're going to have to kind of go there for a while before you can go to heaven. So it's not hell, but it's not a particularly uh, pleasant place, right? Uh, and depending on how bad you were, you will have to stay uh, in purgatory for less or more time. Now, related to purgatory is going to be a practice known as indulgences. Right? So kind of the idea that you can pray for souls that are trapped in purgatory in order to ease their suffering, uh, you know, through masses, but also through individual prayers uh, that you offer on behalf of the dead. Uh, but, you know, so that's one way that you might shorten their time in purgatory. But another way to do it would be actually to, for instance, provide, provide money for the church. Now, it could be for a worthy cause. Right. You could have an uncle that you really love. You know, you, you know that they were a pretty bad person when they were alive, but they were a believer uh, and you would like to shorten their time in purgatory. And so, of course, you would pray for for their soul. Uh, but, you know, maybe the church needs to build a new steeple or they need money for an orphanage. So you might contribute money to the church. And uh, in connection with that, uh, this is what would be called an indulgence. Uh, the church would then have the power to lessen the number of years or days uh, based on how much money you gave or the nature of, of the charity you provided, uh, whereby your uncle's soul would spend less time in purgatory. Uh, now, sounds innocent enough, but I think it's not too hard to imagine how that practice might get abused, particularly if you have, uh, if you have corrupt uh, members uh, of the church who might see this as a way of financially enriching themselves. You know, and at some point you might be paying indulgences not for the soul of your uncle, but for your own soul in anticipation of sins that you have yet to commit. Uh, and if you really, you know, kind of extend the logic here, uh, if you pay enough money, you could sin from now until the day you die, but you would be covered. And that will become eventually a major issue uh, and, and one of the chief forms of corruption that will inspire the Protestant Reformation. You know, so coming back to purgatory, uh, you know, there's also kind of this idea that there might be different levels of purgatory, depending on, you know, what exactly uh, your sins were, how, how many of them you committed and so forth. They really kind of develop a whole cosmology around purgatory. Uh, on the right, we see an image of an angel looking into purgatory, kind of separated by glass. You can see the souls that are waiting to get into heaven. Uh, and, you know, again, this idea is still with us, but, you know, indulgences, that's not really something that is, is done in the church uh, anymore, at least not that I'm aware. So finally, by way of, of concluding our discussion of popular religion, we should talk about pilgrimage, right? Pilgrimage was a kind of spiritual journey, uh, a very powerful way to demonstrate one's commitment to their faith. 
Uh, and the idea is that you would, you know, travel to a church, a holy shrine, uh, holy, and this kind of connects with our discussion of saints and relics because uh, the church houses a relic, uh, something connected with an important saint. It could be a bone from his body, uh, or it might be connected with the life of Jesus. Uh, and so, you know, the idea that by making this journey, you would earn God's favor. And of course, you, you'd have the benefit of praying in front of the relic, right? W whereby the efficacy of your prayer would be greatly enhanced. Probably the most important sites of pilgrimage during the Middle Ages would have been churches in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land. Uh, churches built in connection with, uh, you know, different episodes of the life of Jesus. Uh, we already talked about two of them that were built uh, during the reign of Constantine. Uh, the one, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, marking the place where Jesus is held to have been crucified, buried, and resurrected. Uh, nearby in neighboring Bethlehem would have been the Church of the Nativity. Of course, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is in Jerusalem, and you can see it there in the image. Uh, Church of the Nativity, where Jesus was born. Uh, but by the way, there were other very important churches associated with pilgrimage, uh, certainly in the city of Rome, uh, in large measure because of the papacy, uh, but also in connection with St. Peter. And, and uh, some that, you know, for whatever reason, because of tradition, became really important, uh, though not necessarily associated. I mean, you can't really say it's somehow because that saint was more important than any other saint. Really good example of that would be the town of Santiago de Compostela in Spain, which today is still a major site of pilgrimage in Europe. And here we see the church marking, uh, you know, kind of the center of pilgrimage, uh, Santiago de Compostela in the northern part of Spain. Uh, so there are many traditions associated with it. For instance, people are doing the pilgrimage. Uh, I don't remember exactly at what point. I think it's uh, within 20 miles of the town, but from that point forward, you're no longer driving. You have to walk. And then there are many different rituals associated with the pilgrimage and particular times in the year where it's like a, a much more popular thing to do, right, where you find huge numbers of people uh, showing up. I've actually been to the city, but I went as a tourist, uh, so I actually drove right up to, to the church. Well, on the subject of pilgrimage, as I mentioned, probably the most important center of pilgrimage for Christians in Europe would have been Jerusalem. Uh, but that could prove problematic because by the High Middle Ages, uh, Jerusalem, as with the Holy Land and most of the Middle East, is under Islamic rule. Uh, now, for the most part, Christians still found it quite uh, fairly easy to do the pilgrimage, right? I mean, you know, you would take a boat. Uh, usually landing somewhere on the coastline of uh, what eventually will become called Palestine, uh, and then making your way to Jerusalem. And there would be large numbers, and most of the time it was pretty safe. Uh, but sometimes it might not be safe. And that really didn't have so much to do with persecution, though that did periodically happen, uh, where, you know, kind of the Muslim rulers were persecuting Christians or Christian pilgrims. Uh, you know, by the way, large numbers of the people living there are still Christian, even if the people in charge are not. Uh, but, you know, sometimes Palestine would be the source of conflict between different Muslim kingdoms. And so you could get caught in the middle of that. Uh, and eventually that is going to be a factor leading to what is known as the Crusades, a series of military campaigns uh, waged in the name of Christendom, supposedly to liberate the Holy Land from the infidel, right? So in some ways, very religious in character, even kind of combining elements of pilgrimage with military warfare. Uh, and there are going to be many of them. Probably the best known is the First Crusade, which is really specifically directed at recapturing Jerusalem and the Holy Land from the Muslims. Uh, but initially kind of started uh, as a campaign to support the Byzantine Empire, uh, against Muslim expansion uh, at, it, at its expense into Anatolia, uh, which is the geographical term for what pretty much corresponds to modern-day Turkey. Now, as I mentioned, uh, while most of the time it was quite secure uh, as far as the ability of Christians from Europe to make pilgrimage, you did have incidences of persecution. And one very famous one that would actually become a factor uh, in bringing about the Crusades uh, was connected with the rule of Tariq al-Hakam, the caliph of the Fatimid dynasty based in Egypt from 996 to 1021. Uh, and during his reign, Jerusalem was under Fatimid control. It kind of went back and forth between him and the Seljuks. Uh, and so al-Hakam actually had some, it was really actually kind of more personal issues that he had with his Christian mother. 
Uh, but, you know, and so it's a very kind of compl complicated story. But the long and short of it is, is that he would periodically persecute Christians, including his own Christian subjects, and at one point directed his ire against the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which he destroyed in 1009. Uh, it should be noted that his successor was very apologetic about it, offered uh, the Byzantine Empire uh, to work with them to rebuild it, even though it was in Fatimid territory. Uh, but, you know, because of this incident, uh, rumors very quickly began to circulate around Europe that Christians were being persecuted. Uh, not surprisingly, there was tremendous outrage in Europe that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre had actually been uh, desecrated in this way. And so that is going to be kind of one factor drawing attention to the Holy Land in Europe uh, in, in the sense of raising concerns about the situation there. A more immediate factor leading to the Crusades will be the Battle of Manzikert, fought on August 26, 1071, between the Byzantine Empire and uh, the Seljuk Turks near a place called Manzikert in eastern Anatolia, uh, again, roughly corresponding to the modern state of Turkey, uh, which they lose in spectacular fashion, lose a tremendous amount of territory such that uh, the so-called Muslim infidel is now within easy striking distance of Constantinople. And this eventually is going to lead to the Byzantine emperor Alexis I to appeal to the West for help. Uh, and so uh, his full name, Alexis I Komnenos, is going to appeal. What does it mean to appeal to the West? It means appealing to the head of the Catholic Church, at that time Pope Urban II, uh, prior to becoming Pope, known as Otho of Lajari. Uh, and what does he want? He wants Europe to send some knights to fight with the Byzantine army to retake this territory. That's pretty much all he wants, but he's going to get a lot more than he asked for. So Urban II is going to call a council, the Council of Claremont, uh, with the various heads of church, but also very important political figures, uh, where they're going to meet in 1095, where he calls upon Christians to take up their weapons against the infidel and to recover the Holy Land. Uh, and again, you know, this idea of recovering the Holy Land, uh, Jerusalem, uh, which, you know, granted, very important for Christians, but this was never part of the Byzantine Empire's agenda. They really just wanted some nice to show up and fight alongside their army. Uh, but, but Urban II is calling for something quite different. Uh, and to kind of, you know, provide incentive for this, the Pope promises the remission of sins. All of those who die in battle... Uh, fighting to liberate the Holy Land against the pagan would have their sins forgiven. And so here, if you look at this map, I think you have a pretty clear idea why, as of the eve of the Crusades, circa 1081, uh, the Byzantine emperor was genuinely, it's really a political concern, right? Simply that his empire and his capital are being threatened by enemy forces. Uh, and so eventually, you know, the Crusaders are going to uh, the various knights of Europe are going to put together an army, what becomes the Crusaders, I should say. Uh, I should note, none of the Crusaders who go on the first crusade, and again, there are going to be others, uh, but this is a genuine, you know, the one most often uh, discussed when we're talking about the Crusades. Uh, none of them are going to be rulers. Uh, many of them, though, very important nobles, right? So off they go, marching on their way to Constantinople. Uh, should note, along the way, they kill large numbers of Jews, I suppose kind of a uh, practice run before they get to the Holy Land. Uh, but they're, you know, they're pretty fervent in their religious convictions, so not too happy when encountering uh, non-Christians. Uh, and, and that's going to be a problem when they get to Constantinople, because from their point of view, these Orthodox Christians don't seem very Christian at all. And from the point of view of the Byzantine emperor, uh, emperor, the Crusaders seem like complete barbarians. So he's not even going to allow them into the city. They have to set up camp outside the city. And before long, he realizes that they're never going to fight under his command alongside the Byzantine army. Uh, and also that they have a very separate agenda uh, in connection with this idea of recovering the Holy Land. And so he sends them on their merry way, uh, you know, basically decides better. I'm better off without them here. And so eventually they are successful in conquering the Holy Land, inclusive of Jerusalem. First Crusade had actually set out in 1096, again, mostly made up of noble warriors. There are no kings, no rulers. Uh, and they capture Jerusalem in June of 1099, uh, after a five-week siege that basically sees the massacre of pretty much everyone who lives there. 
Uh, so they're in a pretty, you know, kind of heightened state uh, when they arrive in Jerusalem, you know, tremendous religious fervor. Uh, and, you know, at some point just slaughtering everyone that crosses their path, regardless of whether, in fact, they're Muslim, uh, Christian, Jewish, whether uh, warrior or a civilian. Uh, even by the accounts of the Crusaders, it is a horribly bloody affair. There's, uh, you know, accounts of the blood running up to the knees of their horses. Uh, but they do take Jerusalem and will establish four crusader states uh, the latin kingdom of jerusalem which you see there in white above that the county of tripoli uh, and then the principality of antioch and the county of edessa what we often refer to as crusader states that will pretty much carry on for a bit of time uh, in the end though it, it's going to prove very short-lived the only reason they're able to establish themselves really at this point is because uh, at the time of the Crusades, the Muslim world is in a very politically fragmented state with many different kingdoms fighting with one another, some of them fighting the Byzantine Empire, of course, uh, but, but very heavily divided. Uh, it should be noted, too, that they never anticipated an army coming out of Europe, which from their point of view was, you know, kind of land of the barbarians. Uh, so taken completely by surprise. Uh, but eventually they will regroup. And the decisive figure in that regard will be a Kurdish fellow, by the way, though his Arabic, uh, he has an Arabic name, which is Salah al-Din, Defender of the Faith, uh, more commonly known in Europe as Saladin. His full name, Salah al-Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub. Uh, and after uniting uh, the Muslim world, particularly what roughly corresponds to Egypt and Syria today, uh, will take back Jerusalem in 1187. And uh, he actually proves to be much more civilized than the Crusaders had been. He treats the civilians, the uh, Crusader Christian civilians, quite nicely, uh, even allowing many of them to leave with their property, which is a very unusual thing at that time, uh, and also arranging for Christians to be able to do the pilgrimage moving forward. So he proves to be extremely... Uh, merciful in this regard. And I should note his reputation as someone very uh, chivalrous, right? Somebody who lives by the appropriate warrior's code, treating civilians uh, or non-combatants uh, with mercy, uh, certainly not killing them. Uh, this reputation will, will, uh, will manifest itself not just in the Muslim world, but also in Europe, where he ends up being viewed quite favorably. So just by way of kind of wrapping up the Crusades, there will be subsequent Crusades basically centered around trying to retake the Holy Land. Probably the most famous would be uh, the Third Crusade involving Richard the Lionhearted and Philip II, the rulers of England and France. Uh, and so on. this is a case where you do have rulers going on the Crusades. Uh, and then, you know, another very famous one. Uh, the Seventh Crusade, led by Louis IX of France, uh, which lasts from 1248 to 1254. You might remember we met him uh, in the first part of this lecture when we talked about the centralization of authority in the hands of the king of France. Uh, so he actually is canonized. He is considered to be a saint. Uh, he actually came up with kind of a novel approach. Rather than attacking the Holy Land directly, they kind of had this idea of first trying to gain control of Egypt and then using that as a launching point to attack the Holy Land, but they failed to take Egypt, so uh, it didn't quite work out. Uh, and from that point forward, like there are subsequent crusades, but they tend to be increasingly minor affairs and eventually kind of uh, just, you know, coming to an end. So that is uh, where we're going to conclude with the second part of our lecture. And again, a reminder to answer the questions on the related worksheet.